My name is Stan Mazur. I'm from GTEC, and a title of my presentation is Geodynamics and Petroleum Geology of the Circumarctics. And this is like a brief outline of my presentation, starting from Arctic hydrocarbon potential, then our approach, gravity and magnetic data, the application of 2D modeling, depth to basement studies, plate modeling, paleogeography, and finally, geochemistry. But at the beginning, we should ask the question, why the Arctic is really a hotspot? And the answer seems to be quite obvious because of the largest undiscovered hydrocarbon resources in the world. And the second, the glaciation is in progress. Whether we like it or not, of course, personally, I think that is a big tragedy, this uh, global warming, and we should stop it as soon as possible. However, even if we radically stop emissions now, we will see impact on climate in 50 years, or rather our children will see it. So it means that the deglaciation in Arctic will progress for several years anyway. And uh, yeah, this is demonstrated by this slide. And you know, this is the cover of ice, ocean ice in September 2012. You must know that September is the time of the year when the ice cover is the smallest because ice is melted during the summer and new ice is, is going to form starting from beginning of October. And as a reference, you know, you see this uh, yellow line. It shows the extent of ice cover in the Arctic. This is the average for the last 30 years. So you can easily see the difference. And even it is probably the even better illustration, we can compare the extent of ice cover in the September 1979 and 2007. So you see how fast the glaciation is progressing and if this process will, will go at the same speed in 10, 15 years, we will see the Arctic Ocean free of ice, of course during uh, summer months, I mean mostly August and, and September. At the same time, the far north is opening up. So it means, you know, these are like legendary Northwest Passage, the navigation tract from North Atlantic to Pacific, and also maybe less important, northern route along Russia coast from Pacific to also to uh, Northern Europe. And if we look at Northwest Passage, you know, this pink area is again, average extent of ice in September over the last 30 years. Even in September, the North, Northwest Passage was blocked by ice. However, if we look at blue area, which is the extent of ice in September 2012, it looks that in September, you know, this navigation tract was free, accessible for, for sailing. And in the future, it will probably continue there are also some <coughs> political issues behind because uh, as American government is not always so strict about territorial, ter territorial sovereignty as re recently. And for example, in case of Northwest Passage, previous administration suggested that they may not recognize Canadian sovereignty over North, uh, Northwestern Passage. So some political tensions are possible behind the glaciation of Arctic. However, be because these two countries are close allies, I don't expect major problems. And if we look at this uh, maritime areas claimed by neighboring countries, it's not that bad. Its situation is probably much better if we compare to Antarctica. So the only disputed area is this is, is here, and the dispute is between Russia and 
surprise, uh, Denmark. In that case, Danes seems to be quite demanding, just claiming the area of Arctic Ocean, which is actually quite far from, from the coast of, of Greenland. And you know, this picture probably most, or many of you already, already know, uh, know. This is from USGS Arctic Reserves. And yeah, of course, we can easily see that the biggest reserves are still hidden along North Slope, Mackenzie Delta area, Sverdrup Basin. This is uh, Baffin Bay, Northeast Greenland. But first of all, Laptiev Sea is not bad, but first of all, this is Kara Sea and, and Barents Sea. So this is a kind of, of common knowledge. Of course, there is also some environmental issues related to exploration in, in the Arctic. And the question I'm going to address is how the fundamental issues affecting petroleum systems in the circumarctic, how we can address this or solve these this questions. And the answer given by, by GTAC, the company I'm, I represent, is through a work program which integrates diversity of expertise. And this work program is underpinned by extensive gravity and magnetic data sets, the data sets which are available to, to GTAC. And this is our approach is based on integration of many disciplines as gravity and magnetic interpretation, structural tectonic framework, plate tectonic modeling, sequence stratigraphy, drainage analysis, paleogeography, pale paleoclimatology, petroleum geochemistry, finally petroleum system evaluations. I, I will have no time to discuss all these points. There is also my colleague Dirk present and will be around after the lecture. So if you have a specific question, you can address uh, this question to Dirk. I will focus only on a few points which I feel the most uh, familiar with. This is the study area with the main geologic in 3D with uh, main geological units indicated. And our gravity and magnetic data. This is a compilation based on several sources. So, of course, the highest resolution have uh, marine and airborne gravity magnetics. However, you know the coverage of the Arctic is is patchy. So there are gaps between surveys. Therefore, what GTEC did is it filled the gaps with uh, satellite data which have been processed by GTAC. And then out of satellite data and this high resolution marine and airborne gravity magnetics, GTAC produced a consistent uniform data set covering the entire Arctic. And this is for gravity and this is for, for magnetics. And of course, application of data sets, these data have various applications Structural mapping is the most obvious. So this is an example of GTEC structural data set on the background of, uh, of magnetic data. And this is a like, zoom in example from Canada Basin. These are gravity data. So gravity data are clearly emphasizing the most important geological units as Womanosov Ridge or Alpha Ridge or Chukchi borderland, borderlands. And this is the like, tip of Canada Basin approaching the area of Mackenzie Delta. And you know, the spreading of Canada Basin is still under discussion. Gravity data seems to reveal the position of spreading center quite well. And if we zoom in even on a smaller area, this is comparison between gravity data and geological information taken from the paper by Lane and others. And you see very close res uh, uh, resemblance 
these data are fully consistent. Of course, in the case of the area shown on the pictures, we have geological information, so gravity data are not that critical. However, we can draw a conclusion that in other areas where we don't have geological information, we can rely on gravity data because gravity data provide a fair representation of local geology. Another example is from Baffin Bay. This is gravity data. Baffin Bay is the area when the extent of oceanic crust is under discussion. And our gravity data allow to like, determine easily the extent of oceanic crust, or this red area is oceanic crust, and also to define other basins which are underlined by thin continental crust which are very deep. For example, that, this is a, a Melville Bay basin. To the gravity and magnetic modeling, we have a set of 2D models covering practically entire Arctic. I will not discuss all these models, only concentrate on one selected example. But what, what is uh, modeling for? So we can use 2D modeling to investigate crustal configuration, structural framework, depth, thickness of key horizons, especially depth to, to basement, uh, lithological types, and also quantify extension across a margin. This method has been developed in-house by, by GTEC. How to do it? It's a very, very simple approach. It based on the assumption that a cross-sectional area of the crustal block before and after stretching is the same. So simply we assume like a pure, pure shear stretching as in classical McKenzie model. And then from this simple equation, you can calculate the amount of stretching. And example is from the Laptive Sea. This is quite an interesting area because you know these these are gutter ridge which is present day active plate boundary between Eurasia and North America, but that area Laptive Shelf gutter ridge is approaching a continental margin and this plate boundary it becomes diffuse and poorly defined, and these two lines the maroon line shows the the boundary between. Eurasia and North, North, um, North America derived from plate modeling. It's based on the extent of fossil plates and terrains. And this orange boundary is from present day GPS measurements. You can see that you know, these two boundaries are not exactly uh, matching. There are differences and our model is running across. Yeah, this is again the, the problem. This is Laptive Shelf. This is the end of Gakkel Ridge and Eurasia Basin. The width of oceanic crust in the Eurasia Basin is around 500 kilometers. So the question is how this amount of extension was accommodated <coughs> within a continental shelf. And this, our gravity and magnetic model, which it shows the significant crustal thinning beneath Laptev shelf, and we calculated 450 kilometers of crustal extension across a Laptev continental shelf system. And if we look at the gravity data in more detail, this is Laptev shelf, we see a, a, a number of grabbins, rift valleys, and uplifted blocks caused it's a complex horse and graben system formed in response to, to stretching. And we also used an uh, independent method. We applied 3D inversion of gravity data to calculate, first of all, depth to basement. So red areas are areas of shallow basement or exposed basement. And green and especially blue areas, th this, they are areas of very very deep basement, even more than 10 up to 15 kilometers. By implication, these areas 
co they contain very thick sedimentary pile and are good candidates for exploration. And we also calculated the amount of, of extension. Oh, this, these lines, these profiles are synthetic. In general, they show good agreement with our calculation from 2D model, and they show that amount of stretching of crustal extension is rapidly growing from the coast of Siberia, is like 230 kilometers, up to 500 kilometers near the boundary between continent and, and oceanic crust. And we used the same approach to produce a depth to basement map for the entire Arctic. Again, red areas are areas of shallow basement. Blue areas are, they are areas of very deep, deep basement. And as it worked for Laptev Shelf, we believe that it also mostly works for the entire Arctic. Of course, you need to read it with some caution because, for example, we have a blue area here. This is simply a Brooks, Brooks range. In that case, like deep basement is really deep, crystalline, uh, crystalline rocks, but this blue color represents a thick pile of naps over thrusted in the Brooks range. Of course, this is not a petroleum basin, but in contrast, we can see uh, North Slope or Barents Sea as a major, major sedimentary basins. And this is crustal thickness calculated out of depth to basement. Yeah, it mostly corresponds to the extent of, of oceanic crust. Of course, oceanic crust is the thinnest, so we can easily spot North Atlantic, Eurasia Basin, Canada Basin. Of course, there are some exceptions. Here is Alpha Ridge, which is also probably developed on oceanic crust, but this is a fossil volcanic center, so crust is relatively thick, this, despite the fact that it's probably underlined by, uh, by oceanic crust. And plate model. So our plate model is also built based on uh, gravity and magnetic data. For example, from magnetic data, you can easily s see uh, the linear seafloor anomalies, you can easily define the areas which, is, uh, which corresponds to oceanic crust, as here, and the rest represents uh, continental blocks. And this is our pres present day plate, plate models showing around 100 plates and terrains defined in the Arctic. And this is a co their construction for Maastrichtian and Cretaceous. So one of things, you know, the red area, it represents the area of extension. Plate models suggest 450 kilometers of extension across the Laptev shelf. And th this is in a good agreement with our calculation using 2D modeling and inversion of gravity data. So the, say, the di different methods are giving more or less similar results. You can also see Womonosov Ridge at that time being part of northern Siberia. And this is Womonosov, the shape of Womonosov Ridge as derived from underwater sounding. And maybe therefore in 2007 or 8, I don't remember exactly, a Russian submarine planted a Russian flag on Womonosov Ridge. There are also some political claims that uh, Womonosov Ridge should be uh, part of Russian territorial waters because as a part of continental crust previously was part of Siberia. However, it might be quite dangerous using geological criteria to define political boundaries because we should remember that the present day boundary between North America and Eurasia is running across Eastern Siberia, so using the same criteria, Russia should pass the entire Eastern Siberia, transfer it to Alaska. So, you know, I think, I, I think that Womanosov Ridge is not worth doing. And another example, this is uh, the plate construction for, uh, for 
beginning of Cretaceous, just showing opening of Canada Basin, cl closure of South Anui Ocean, and also like major stretching, thinning of uh, along margins of Greenland. All areas of crustal thinning are shown in, in red. In contrast, compression is shown in purple, like in this tertiary compression in, in later. In uh, Eurekian origin or along Vierkhoyansk thrust and fault belt, And this is also quite interesting exercise because we can also split our potential field data following plate boundaries and try to rotate uh, potential field data as plates in the plate model. And yeah, we can spot some geophysical lineaments which are now randomly distributed somewhere in Chukchi plate and uh, now Russia offshore, northern Canada, and also in Greenland. But after per running reconstruction, we first let's zoom in on this Greenland area. This is a construction for 95 million years. And now these lineaments are matching. And another example. This are reconstruction for 150 million years. Again, we can just reconstructing position of plates in the past, we also can match geophysical, geophysical lineaments. Another approach is paleogeography. Of course, paleogeography is based on the like, fundamental concept of base level, so, you know, the areas above base level is tectonophysiographic terrains undergoing erosion and below base level are sedimentary basins with different deposition environments. We have uh, extensive data sets concerning uh, uh, ge paleogeography data. And this is one example how we can use paleogeography data is uh, for key meridian, so very important for formation of source rocks. And the open question is how fresh oceanic water was at that time delivered to sphere group basin. So most of people suggest connection with Tethys across Northern Europe, but it, this is problematic because there were only very shallow shelf seas in the area of Northwest, North, Northwestern Europe at that time. And we compiled lithofacious data and in our paleogeographic reconstruction, quite clearly, there is a, a passage, a seaway between high Arctic and spherical basin and the world ocean across Eastern Siberia. How it works, you know, this, this pattern represents a deep water fascias these outcrops are now randomly scattered. However, when we reconstruct the position of plates back to situation from Jurassic, so from before opening of the Canada Basin, then all these ran or apparently random outcrops of deep water fascias, they form a consistent, consistent extent showing the existence of a deep sea, a deep sea seaway across Eastern Siberia. And finally, geochemistry is more or less how it works. Uh, you know, this is a sample of oil and this is a gas chromatograph so you put a sample in the chromatograph, heat it, and uh, measure like uh, gas, gas fractions. And this is the graph. Time is on the horizontal axis and quantity on the uh, vertical axis. And red numbers shows the length of hydrocarbon chain. The important thing is that this diagram is as a fingerprint. 
So every reservoir has specific specific pattern of, of, of this diagram. And yeah, we have data from several uh, oil, oil fields across the Arctic, and we have the, we have a full coverage of, of results uh, concerning uh, uh, oil chromatography. As well, we can, use, we can use it also as biomarkers because some, some uh, hydrocarbons are characteristic of the type of, uh, of source rocks. So we can differentiate between uh, terrestrial or lacustrine uh, organic matter. And finally, modeling, it was also uh, uh, showed by Neil in, for Croatia, this is 1D modeling. So as an input, you, you, you input uh, your stratigraphy data and also uh, vitrinite reflectance data. This is example from Mackenzie Delta showing that the major boreal was in early tertiary and also it was the time yeah, what, what you can derive from 1D modeling, you can derive time of maturation, time of generation, and time of expulsion. Three very important things. You can also run a 2D model. 2D model provides all these three uh, important information mentioned before, and in addition, also direction of migration. Of migration. And finally, integrations. I, I will show this, this is my last slide. This I will show it only on using two data sets, our depth, depth to basement and extent of uh, sedimentary basins derived from geological data. And we overlay, overlay these two layers and we can see that in some areas there is a very good match so sedimentary basins overlap with very deep basement predicted by geophysics inversion of gravity data. It's not always the case. For example, if you take, for example, Hope Basin, which is a small tertiary basin, now there is no deep basement. I cannot say that there is no oil in Hope Basin, but the risk, the risk is definitely bigger. So as the major potential sedimentary basins, uh, you can easily see North Slope, Beaufort Sea, South Kara Basin, and also Barents Sea. Yeah, I, I agree that there is like no luck in exploration in the Barents Sea, but if we try, uh, especially the Russian part of the Barents Sea, it's probably, according to our data, the, deep, the deepest basin in, in the Arctic. And if we have these two layers and overlap them, and in some areas they are matching, we can say that in these areas there's a lower risk of exploration. And now you can imagine that we have more layers. We have also geochemistry, paleogeography, and other layers, and we overlap all of them on top of each other. And hopefully there will be some areas where these data are, are matching, are indicating that in these areas are promising according to different data sets. So therefore, exploration in the Arctic is not necessarily a, a Russian roulette. We, geology and geophysics can help, can indicate that some areas are lower risk than the other areas. This is the end. However, I still have, if you are patient enough, I have like two minutes long uh, animation showing a plate tectonic evolution of, of the Arctic area. Can I ask to, to show this an, uh, animation, please? Yeah, it would take maybe 30 seconds to change because it's a separate, uh, separate file. And yeah, this is very, very simple plate, plate tectonic animation showing plate tectonic evolution of, of the Arctic area. Yes. 
and hopefully it will work after pressing, yeah. So yeah, th it shows time step is two and a half million years. And you can see like gradual anti-clockwise rotation of Eurasia and closing of the South Anui Ocean, at the same time opening of Central Atlantic and extension along Greenland margins and now opening of the Canada, ba Canada Basin. And further on, spreading in the Labrador Sea and opening of the Baffin Bay. Finally, breakup of Northern Atlantic and opening of the Eurasia Basin. So this is the way how to demonstrate in like easily, uh, very, very simple way of showing our plate, plate modeling results. All right, thank you for your attention. Uh, any, anybody got any questions? And if not, let me ask one. Um, do you think what you've done is much more detailed than what the USGS has done now in understanding the the texture, if I can use that phrase, of the Arctic? You mean as in terms on undiscovered resources? Well, I, I'm asking about the geology from yeah, which the question it, okay, is, it, are their numbers right, I guess? Or, yeah, or yeah, so in terms of geology, this is an easier question. So yes, I, I, I believe that it is much more detailed compared to USGS work in terms of, for example, depth to basement study or plate modeling reconstructions or 2D modeling. Yeah, we have much higher resolution <coughs> data sets. Okay. I, you know, I, I wouldn't say the same about the esti estimates of undiscovered hydrocarbon potential sure. because, you know, there's many elements and if you have errors, the uh, errors are m m multiplying. However, if you look at specific uh, data sets, yes, we have much, much higher resolution. Okay, anybody else? If not, Stan, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.